Thank you, Aparna. I think it was an excellent lecture and a lot of take-home points for everybody, you know, particularly people who are looking at patients uh, who have been, you know, post-bariatric surgery. And I'm sure there are a lot of difficulties that they face. I want to open up the platform, uh, you know, for a panel discussion. I want to introduce Dr. Nita Deshpande, who is a bariatric physician at the city of Belgaum. She's done immense amount of work in the field of uh, in the field of obesity, and nobody better than her to conduct the panel discussion. I would also like to take the opportunity to introduce Dr. Guillermo Umpiras. He's the chairman of IDEC and the uh, president of the ADA. And uh, it's wonderful to have you with us, Guillermo, and look forward to a very active participation. We have Dr. Caroline Apivian. She's from the Brigham's and uh, she's uh, she's uh, been our guest star today and excellent lecture that she delivered. So look forward to a great interaction ahead and over to you, Nita. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. And uh, uh, I welcome everyone once again, especially those people who joined in late. And uh, we will now launch into the panel discussion, the question and answer session. And the very first question is from one of our very own IDEC members, Dr. Nitin Kapoor, who's here. But I'm going to read the question that he's posted in the chat box. And this is for Professor Caroline. Uh, he asks that now that we're using body composition more than ever before in clinical practice, we find a large number of patients with sarcopenic obesity in our practice. So in addition to ensuring adequate protein intake and resistance exercises, what other tips or medications would you suggest that can help manage these patients? Wow, that's a great question, Dr. Kapoor. Um, first of all, while it's true that we have better techniques for measuring body composition, it's still true that the cheapest way uh, and, and most cost of easiest way of doing uh, of checking for obesity is still the BMI. So many people will not be able to check body composition. Having said that, we know that after bariatric surgery and in older patients, we know we're going to get a lot of muscle loss, especially if those patients don't do resistance exercise training and eat more protein. How much is more protein? 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Most people don't get this kind of protein intake after bariatric surgery and in the elderly. So there are um, more uh, ways of enhancing body composition. Um, if the patient does have low testosterone levels and is a male, um, you know, they have to have low testosterone levels, but a little bit of testosterone replacement might help. Um, we're looking into, uh, it's still research, but growth hormone, still in research studies, not ready for prime time yet. And then there are, uh, for women, hormone replacement therapy is now considered important. It, the, the WHO study, you know, was a flawed study that put hormone replacement in patients who already had heart disease, age 65, that's too late. That's why it showed an increased rate of cardiovascular events. We now know that it was a flawed study and we now have our up-to-date women's health providers prescribing hormone replacement therapy for women in perimenopause. I urge everyone to look at the literature now and prescribe when necessary. Hormone replacement for women um, include and resistance exercise and higher protein, same is true for men, plus consider testosterone. And in the future, we should have agents that increase muscle mass and uh, help fat loss. One is in studies currently and has been, uh, and is ready for prime time in the next few years. But that's what I would recommend now is increase protein, uh, resistance exercise, and consider uh, anabolic agents. Right. So uh, there's one question that uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Aparna. And that is that uh, in the population that needs bariatric surgery, people with morbid obesity, with BMIs upwards of 40, and those who can afford it, there is a huge resistance to it as yet in India. 
despite the fact that they have tried and failed so many times at different kinds of uh, weight management. So what, in your opinion, in a country like India, where bariatric surgery is still not taken off to the extent that it should, what, in your opinion, is the way that we go about educating the public uh, about bariatric surgery? I know you've covered a few myths and uh, uh, in your lecture, but in general, in short, could you tell us how we could do this? I think, uh, uh, Dr. Deshmande, one of the things which probably, I think the first barrier is that people don't look at it as a disease. That is number one. Uh, they still view it as, uh, you know, um, even today, I think in our country, these are people who would be uh, considered as coming from a you know affluent family and having enough food on the table and things like that. Uh, second thing is that uh, people are not aware about the the progression of the disease, what it can lead to. So even today, like I mentioned in my talk, that we see patients who come, then they don't get treated. Then there is an event which pushes them into surgery. And then when we evaluate, we see that the ejection fraction has gone down to 20% and they've missed the bus. So <clears throat> they don't know that this is how dangerous it can be, you know, for many, many people and or how it can affect their knees, how it can lead to cirrhosis of liver. Today, I mean, obesity is one of the biggest causes for cirrhosis after, I mean, it's, it's said to have overtaken alcohol as a cause of cirrhosis. So people are not aware about that. And I think we need to educate them about the sequelae of obesity, just like we've made them aware about the sequelae of diabetes. And that is what has kind of, you know, uh, given a seriousness to that disease. So that is where we need to start working. And uh, that would be one of the other things. Cost was definitely one of the barriers for uh, surgery as well. And I think probably with insurance coming in, that barrier would be broken to some extent. But any surgery, I mean, including a surgery for gallstone, I think we, including cancer. I mean, we've seen people going for alternative therapies and things like that. They don't want to get operated because there is a certain kind of stigma and fear attached with surgery. So that is bound to be there, but there is a lot of work which we need to do, I think. Right. Thank you for that. So there is a question here from uh, Dr. Suresh Shinde from Pune, who is an avid researcher himself. And the question to, is to Dr. Caroline, which says, does semaglutide have any peripheral lipolytic action in addition to its central anorectic action? Um, no, there is no uh, peripheral lipolytic action of uh, semaglutide. We are looking into its action as a, uh, de a, a in decreasing the metabolic gap that um, occurs with weight loss. Um, and that metabolic gap may be restored by hormonal activity. Uh, that is dampened by loss of leptin. So we don't think that GLP-1s are working by directly increasing brown fat activity. If that, That's what I think the, the uh, questioner is asking about. Um, you know, but we think it, it does have another... Uh, uh, augmentation of energy expenditure by increasing the metabolic gap that is reduced by lack of leptin. Right. So, uh, Dr. Guillermo has a question. So, Carolyn, thanks, thanks for participating with the iTech. Um, yes, it's great so, to see it's you. So, so, so hard to uh, have an intake greater than 1.5 to 2 grams of protein a day. I mean, I'm in the 60s and my wife told me that I needed to do to eat one gram of, you know, per kilo per day. And I can't eat 80, 100 or 75 grams uh, of proteins a day. Uh, how, how do you do it? That's a great question. Um, so what I recommend to my patients is... Uh, a protein shake and the best time so in older patients and even younger patients the best way to replace uh, muscle loss is um, not just at one meal so most people eat most of the protein at dinner that's not going to work because you need the muscle needs 
the amino acids during injury and uh, in between meals as well. And so what I recommend to patients is to take in protein at each meal. So that would mean in the morning, yogurt and milk and eggs or a protein shake. Now your protein shake, typically if you make it yourself, you're gonna get a whey casing powder that's gonna give you 20 grams of protein per shake, all right? So you're gonna mix that with milk and some berries to make it taste good. Now that's gonna be, you know, if you can't do that because it's so many calories, that's on, you know, that can give you, if you take it twice a day, it's gonna give you an extra 40 grams of protein. If you can't do that, then there are powders that uh, there's one called Juven, J-U-V-E-N, that you can get on Amazon. That is a, a powder that you mix with water and it's amino acids. And the amino acids are all the essentials plus extra leucine and arginine. And it has been shown that um, if you use it right after um, you know, activity, physical activity, like, you know, you ran or whatever, um, it's going to go right to the muscle to uh, replenish those amino acids and help wound healing and muscle accretion. Juven, it was used in the hospital for older people, but I can tell you that the Patriots are using it for their football players to enhance muscle um you know, uh, anabolism in between their, you know, practices. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Juven so, is the, Juven That was is really great. an interesting question. And we all mm -hmm. grapple with that, uh, with the uh, protein intake. So thanks for that question. And thanks for the answer as well. So uh, there is one question. Uh, Sanjay has asked this question. And this is for Dr. Aparna. Uh, post bariatric surgery, when there is weight regain, when do you decide to introduce either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or revision surgery? Or do you do both? Um, so this is a very gray area where I think uh, it's, it's completely as per the clinical discretion. There is no guideline for us uh, today to decide that at what juncture would I start using a drug or where would I institute a revision surgery. But I can say one thing with confidence that with incoming drugs, even though we don't have injectable semaglutide as yet in our country, uh, pharmacotherapy has definitely decreased the rates of uh, revision surgery even in India, even with uh, just having glutide because we've seen that it works pretty well uh, with post-surgery weight regain. And uh, my guideline to my patients is that whatever is the nadir weight that you have achieved, the lowest weight that you got to, if you feel that there is an increasing trend and you have regained 5 kgs from there, please come back to us because we will need to see what is going wrong. Uh, of course, I mean, it could be just the natural progression or sometimes they deviate from their, you know, lifestyle and uh, th something happens and they stop uh, going to the gym, exercising. So we try to motivate them. But if the trend is increasing, uh, we wouldn't allow the weight gain to go up beyond five, seven kilos. We would institute the drug there because it's much easier for us to handle a five, seven kgs of weight regain as compared to a 10 to 15 kgs of weight regain. But yes, of course, there are patients who've been operated 10 to 15 years back. Mm -hmm. Some of them have come back with significant amount of weight regain and uh, uh, they've come back by 30, 40 kgs of weight regain. Then probably so a revision surgery would be uh, um, an option. But even there, we would use pharmacotherapy as a first line of therapy and see where they get to. If they are showing a decreasing trend and if they're doing well, uh, we've had patients losing 15 to 20 kgs even on glutide. And uh, if they do that, then we don't really need to do a revision in that patient. But then we do guide them that pharmacotherapy is something that may be needed again as well. So once they come to the target, we stop. We just maintain on diet and lifestyle modification. If the weight regain happens again, then we may again need to institute the drug therapy. So this is something where I think it's completely on our clinical discretion. We don't really have any guidelines at the moment for this. Right. 
that's a very nice answer thank you for that uh, then uh, another question about again a glp1 receptor agonist from dr suresh shinde and this is to dr carolyn uh, he says glp1 is basically a prandial hormone what happens physiologically when we give it during the fasting state when there is no glucose coming from the gut a great question so yes it is a postprandial hormone. Um, it only works, however, in to increase insulin from the pancreas when glucose levels are high. And Guillermo, please correct me if I'm not saying something, you know, quite right. But it it only works as a hypoglycemic agent when glucose levels are high. So it's not gonna cause hypoglycemia during the fasting state. Having said that, however, we would be careful, we should be careful when patients use it post-bariatric surgery. Why? We, because some of those patients do have um, late post-bariatric hypoglycemia, and we don't want to use it in that case, even if a patient needs to lose weight, um, because th that hasn't been studied. But having said that, um, yeah, in the fasting state, what it's going to do is still going to have its peripheral effects on delaying gastric emptying and um, gastric motility, and it's still going to have its effects on uh, satiety because the GLP receptors are also in the brain. Right. So uh, I think since time is running out, we will have one last question uh, from Dr. Anjali. She's raised her hand. So Anjali, uh, you can ask your question now. First of all, I would like to thank Aparnadi for coming and joining. She's a very dear friend. Uh, we know each other for more than a decade now, even probably more than that studied together, had a very wonderful journey together. So, uh, Dr. Aparna, I have a question. I am seeing a couple of patients who uh, are now pregnant after their bariatric surgery. The micronutrient recommendations, are they different in pregnancy compared to non-pregnant people? Oh, no, you did. So, pregnancy is uh, recommended after about 18 months of bariatric surgery. Uh, that is a time uh, when uh, they start eating better and uh, they're able to take a lot more food than they would in the beginning uh, of surgery. And um, uh, what we normally do is that we would uh, just do a check at that time to assess what is the nutritional deficiency status and supplement as per the deficiency state. We don't really uh, supplement them extra up, up from the normal uh, folic acid and stuff like that but there is no additional uh, supplementation which is needed uh, just because of surgery sure thank you thank you so much and uh, we've had a wonderful session it has been a fantastic panel discussion and i thank both the speakers all the delegates who have joined in and been very interactive and uh, at the end i would just like dr sanjay to give concluding remarks before we sign off Thank you very much, Dr. Caroline, for accepting our invitation to speak today. It's been a wonderful lecture, and uh, I think all our attendees have been privileged to hear your thoughts on, uh, you know, on the subject. You have been a pioneer in uh, obesity, and obviously your recommendations go a long way, and uh, it obviously clears a lot of doubts for all of us. Uh, Dr. Aparna. I just want to say something about Dr. Aparna's talk. It was wonderful, Dr. Aparna. You gave a better talk than most of what I've heard in, in uh, bariatric surgery talk. So excellent job. Thank you. Thank you so Love much, uh, Dr. Caroline. And I, I am also very educated about the drug after your talk. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna, for being here. And I think the greatest compliment comes from Dr. Caroline. For, and I think it's a very, very big compliment. And pleasure to have you with us. And we look forward to have both of you again. And Dr. Caroline, we look forward to invite you to India for sure uh, during one of our uh, you know meetings, and uh, hope to see you soon in India. So thank with you. this, we'll sign off, and I would like to thank all the delegates 
for joining up and listening to this wonderful interaction on obesity. And from IDEC, we promise to bring you more science in future. So look out in the space for more, you know, scientific talks to come. And thank you, the entire IDEC team who worked around the clock at the back end to make all this possible a seamless presentation. Uh, so thank you all of you and good night. Thanks. Thanks once thank again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Bye. Pleasure, Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.